welcome to today's show of The Laundromat Millionaire. We have a new guest today. Yes, you don't have to listen to Dave and I again. You Yay. actually get a break. <laughs> I know y'all listen to, like to listen to me talk, but sorry, guys. You're going to have to listen to our guest today. His name is Matt Hilton, and he's a rock star laundromat owner that I've had to actually the privilege of coaching for a little bit, and he attended, Carla, our most recent pickup and delivery workshop. This guy is doing some things out in Kansas City, Missouri, and we are excited to bring his story to you. It's unique. He's actually a second-generation laundromat owner, but interestingly enough, he didn't take over for his dad. His dad actually is still running his own businesses, and he started his own enterprise on his own without any help. I mean, I'm sure he had some guidance from his dad, and he also works a full-time job as a, full, as a commercial HVAC technician. So he's very hands-on, and part of the reason we want to share his journey is he's a multi-store owner. Um, he is a second-generation owner, but a little bit different flavor of that, and he's very hands-on. He fixes his own equipment. He does a lot of his own repairs and installations and things like that. So we thought that our audience would get some, some good information out of this. So welcome to another episode. Let's jump right into it. Okay, before we get started on today's episode, we do want to take a moment to remind you of a very cool opportunity that we just started on our website. If you haven't heard about it yet, it's the Laundromat Millionaire Community. It is a membership where you can gain access to everything that we have about laundromats. So products that we've created, um, forms you can download, um, all kinds of stuff that we use in our laundromat that you can use in yours. Um, even a searchable video library in case you're researching the industry or certain aspects of the industry. Yeah, you get discounts. You get the ability to chat with me in a more intimate setting on very specific topics. You get distributor and product reviews mm -hmm. from users in the community. It's a behind the scenes intimate community that I'm very involved in, we're very passionate about, and we'd love for you to check it out on our website. Go to laundromatmillionaire.com, click on the community tab and see what it's all about. So Matt, welcome to the show. We're so excited to see you again. Thanks, good to see you guys too. Yeah, absolutely, man. We appreciate you taking the time out of your day. I know uh, between your, your and we'll get into it in a minute, but I know between your full-time job and these businesses and these businesses and being a dad and, and all I these things. I don't know how you things, do it. Uh, you you must not sleep. <laughs> <laughs> are you like one of those people that needs like two hours of sleep or something? Uh, about five hours, six hours oh, is usually what I like yeah. to get. Yeah. Mm. I'm so jealous. Never I like eight like or nine. <laughs> <laughs> Never been like that my whole life. <laughs> In fact, I think when when you were at the pickup and delivery workshop, I was talking to your dad, uh, and you had stepped away for something, and he was like, "Yeah, he's always just been this high energy kid, mm -hmm. and it's carried over." He said, "He said when you were younger, they always wondered if it would carry into adulthood." He was like, "Cause I'm not a high energy guy." He was like, "But he just goes and gets up early in the morning and does his workouts and all this stuff." That's awesome. That's yeah. fantastic. Well, at least yeah, he channeled it for good. High energy, but he is too. He he doesn't slow down. So. Doesn't slow down. Yeah. That's awesome. Awesome. Yeah, it was awesome getting to know you guys for sure. Well, listen, we want to jump right into this episode. And what we ask our uh, our guests to do, if you don't mind, is just start by, you've, you've watched the show, I know. So you know where we're going with this. We ask you to just kind of take us back to your childhood. And just real briefly, we don't need to spend a lot of time there. Tell us what it was like as a little kid growing up in your home and those, what we call those formative years. Obviously, your dad was in the industry when you were younger and how that kind of formed how you are today. And then, of course, we're going to jump right into your story. And, and some of the powerhouse moves you're making today in your market. So can you start us out there? Sure, sure. So um, I'm the oldest of two. Uh, my parents got married back uh, not too long after high school, high school sweethearts. And then say maybe about four or five years old, my dad bought his first rental house. And so I grew up with him going to the rental houses and fixing stuff and, you know, whatever project. He was a very hands-on mm -hmm. person, still is a very hands-on person. And then let's see, in about 30 years ago, so I was probably closer to about 10 or 12 years old, my dad bought his first laundromat, um, an unattended store. And then um, it kind of grew from there. He, he ended up ended up buying the one across the street about a year later, and then mm -hmm. you know, just kind of snowballed after that. Um, and now he's got, he's got four and um, 
I mean, so I kind of grew up with it in high school, so to speak, you know, and, okay. and like early eighth grade, stuff like that. And, and he's in the same I market as you, right? You're in Kansas City? In all of Kansas City, yeah. Yeah. Okay. His, uh, his are mostly north of the river. And then um, <clears throat> mine, two um, are down uh, central in the midtown Kansas City mm. area. And then I just built a new store uh, north of the river um, in Gladstone. So, okay. Yeah. And what are your stores called? Just to give you some advertising. Uh, <laughs> mega wash. <laughs> yeah. So we got the mega wash stores here in Kansas City. So. Mega wash. Nice. Fantastic. Fantastic. So was working in your dad's laundromat kind of your first job? Was that like your high school job or did you Not do something really. else? Really? No. Uh, I mean, it, it was, it wasn't work. It wasn't, it wasn't paid. Yeah. <laughs> Free yeah. labor. Yeah. Yeah. Job, right? yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, just helping stuff like that here and there. Yeah. But uh, I ended up getting a couple other jobs, you know, through high school and stuff like that and doing other things. Um, but I did help out when I could, you know, I did a lot of hands-on stuff with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so growing up, seeing him work in laundromats, did it make you want to get in laundromats or were you like, oh, I'll never do that? <laughs> um, I think it, it gave me an appreciation for the hard work and mm -hmm. um, the uh, dedication and time it takes to actually do some of this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the technical side of it, I like. Um, I'm an HVAC guy by trade. So I don't go in an HVAC field with my commercial heating, cooling stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, so washers and dryers and stuff like that aren't too unfamiliar or too hard to grasp mm -hmm. uh, repairs and, and things like that. But uh, he, uh, he showed me the value of uh, working hard and being dedicated to something and then having something of your own, the entrepreneurial side of it mm -hmm. very yeah. well. So that was nice. Um, <clears throat> and I've learned a lot from him as a resource when we started our laundry match in 2016 so prior to that you did full-time hvac is that was yeah, that your yeah, first craft uh, yeah yeah that's pretty much it um i do have a college degree but yeah i, I ended up uh, in the hvac industry um mm -hmm. union pipe fitter working on you know big big equipment uh -huh. um, yeah. big buildings and stuff like that hospitals and schools how did so. you end up doing that i'm always curious because i know you're a very hands-on person and when it comes to your laundromats we want to get into that because i know i talk about the fact i'm not i was yeah. at one point i'm not anymore but there's a lot of value that i think our audience can get from people like you that are doing things boots on the ground um mm -hmm. so we want to get into that too but yeah how did you get started into hvac um <laughs> so i was actually in school for uh dental school. Uh, so I have a degree oh, wow. in biology, minor in chemistry. And okay. um, while I was doing that and working in the labs, my summertime job was helping a residential heating cooling guy out. Hmm. And it was such a contrast uh, of oh, yeah. somebody's house and helping them out being the hero versus somebody coming into the lab and you have to extract some teeth and them hating you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Get that. <laughs> I also found out that uh, I wasn't very good at having to do the same repetitive things over again and mm. being stuck in uh, a chair, so to speak. Yeah, uh, that, that didn't really seem to fit me very well at that time. Um, still doesn't today. But yeah, so I ended up uh, doing residential for a little bit. And then one of my best friends, his dad ran a uh, union pipe fitter shop here in Kansas City doing service work. And he offered me um, to get into the union apprenticeship. So I spent five years going through the apprenticeship nice. um, and did that. Yeah, Great That's opportunity. Awesome. I wish yeah. more kids would get into that. There's so many, there's such a big demand for those trained for labor jobs, you know, like yeah. the craftsman type jobs. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And so it's I, a skill set, you know. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, much needed one for sure. People, oh, it seems like it seems like our society, not to get on a soapbox, seems like our society spent so many years degrading the trades, which mm -hmm. that's where I'm from too. Um, yeah. That that it talked to all these you know generations into believing it's not sexy and it's not something mm -hmm. they want to do. And now we have this huge shortage, and mm -hmm. I don't know that we're now realizing how valuable it is. I think we always knew that, but when there's a shortage, well, it's good for you, right? Supply and demand. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, Matt gets mm -hmm. a lot of lots of raises. That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. There's nothing better than free. Ever heard that before? Well, it's not true. You know what your laundromat customers like even better than free? It's fast. That's right. They want to save time more than they want to save money in most cases. They want to get in and out of your laundromat as fast as possible and they'll pay more for that experience. We're proof of that here in Cincinnati. That's why we added HM Company drain troughs into our newest store in Cincinnati. 
While they may never know why, your customers will love that your washers all drain better and faster than with old school drain pipes. As if that wasn't enough, every HM drain trough is made in the USA, so they ship in only a few weeks and everyone is custom made just for you and your project. If you want to provide your customers with a top of the industry experience in your store, then contact your distributor to order your HM Company drain trough today or visit draintroughs.com. All right. So listen, we want to jump into your laundromat story because I know you have a very cool journey, um, you know, getting started in the industry as a young kid and seeing how your dad ran the businesses. How did that form you deciding to get into the industry? Like, did he bring you the first store and say, hey, I know of this location or how, what What made you get into the industry? How'd you get that first store? So um, I started rental houses pretty early on. Um, during, during my apprenticeship, actually, um, mm -hmm. doing HVAC stuff, mm -hmm. um, I realized the value for some kind of income that wasn't reliant on my hourly work. Mm -hmm. And so I was doing rental houses and fixing them up, flipping them, whatever, you know, so forth. Um, I'm doing those. And in 2016, uh, my dad and I were, we, we have Sunday dinner every, every week. Uh, we, we get together for dinner and all of us as a family just sit down and eat and talk and hang out and, and catch up. Mm -hmm. And what uh, ended up happening is he was talking about the service tech that, that he used uh, for his stores, mm -hmm. found a store that was closed down and the landlord's trying to rent it out. It was a complete zombie map. It's shut down for six, nine months, something like that. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of, back and forth about, am I going to do it? Am I not going to do it? Am I going to do it? And my dad was telling him, you should do it. You should do it. You should do it. And he just couldn't pull the trigger. And I told my dad after talking to him, like, well, if he doesn't want to pull the trigger, it's something I'm interested in, but I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Mm -hmm. And so one thing led to another and he decided not to do it. So then I went in and did it. So I took over a space that was <laughs> basically a zombie mat for six, nine months, 10 months, whatever it was, completely closed down. <clears throat> we went in, fixed what we could, and then slowly started replacing equipment to make it a store. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, that was the first store in 2016, just a small 2,000 square foot unattended laundromat. Mm -hmm. um, then within a year, about 30 blocks away, there's a 6,000 square foot store that used to be a laundromat that it got foreclosed on. Mm -hmm. The building was up for sale. And so he actually brought that to me and goes, Hey, I know this building up the streets from where you're already going. Mm -hmm. Is it something you might be interested in? So we talked about it. We ended up negotiating it, talked to the bank and ended up buying a building. So nice. then we started um, basically a shell, but it had the basic infrastructure, uh, the water lines, the, Electrical was there, um, the gas lines, all that other stuff was there. Uh, but it was it was rough inside. It was, it was really rough. <laughs> How old was the store when it when it went under? <sighs> that store has been a store for about thirty five years, okay. maybe a little bit longer. And <clears throat> it was it wasn't managed very well. Um, mm -hmm. It was you know uh, probably a poor business decision after another you know kind of snowballed into a few things, and the guy ended up closing up. Um, so we went in very cautiously, not under, not really sure how much it could do, but, you know, knowing that we had to make a building payment and everything like that mm -hmm. and slowly worked it up and, and have built it up to something fairly decent. So that was, uh, that was the first mega wash store. And then, um, about a year ago, I found another store that was, uh, closing up and went in and negotiated a lease for a store that was closing up and uh, <laughs> did a complete rehab there. And that's our, our second uh, mega wash location. So, you have two stores that are mega wash and then you have your original store that's that's not under that name. Is that correct? correct. Yeah, it, it's uh, it was called Rainbow Laundry and I just mm -hmm. left it the same name. I didn't want any confusion or anything like that and really hadn't come up with any branding ideas until okay. we actually owned a building with a name on it, so to speak. Right. Okay. How close are your three locations to each other? Um, the two, the Rainbow and the Mega Wash downtown are within 30 blocks on the same street almost. Nice. Um, the other store is about 11 or 12 miles north on the other side of the river. Uh, okay. How long does it take you to travel between them then? 
about 25, 30 minutes. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's doable. It's nothing, nothing crazy. Uh, Yeah. That's about like ours. Yeah. 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 So the first two stores, they don't really compete with each other or they do, but they complement each other. Um, I would say they complement each other, but it's, it's different. Um, it's similar equipment. So that's kind of nice. Um, and then, um, you know, touchscreen hips machines and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, it's different clientele. Even being thirty blocks away is is funny mm-hmm. because you get different groups of people in pockets, and mm-hmm. you know they only go so far for a laundry mat. It seems like. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I've thought about rebranding that store as well. You know, trying to cohesively name everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, at this point in time, it's not uh, the main focus. Yeah. Well, you're building a brand, so it might be good to you know, you're you have a nice brand, so. Share yeah. it with the other store. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, especially when it's 30 blocks away. So what are your stores like as far as hours, unattended or attended? Do you do drop so, off? Do you do delivery? All that stuff. Yeah. Um, the the one rainbow store is unattended mm-hmm. uh, just to have people come in and clean uh, mm-hmm. throughout. And then um, it's 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. is kind of our schedule mm-hmm. at all the stores. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> I don't have any 24-hour stores. The... Um, Pickup and delivery is something I'm trying to grow right now. I'm running it out of the 6,000 square foot store downtown. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got some commercial accounts and a few residential stuff, but uh, it's it's slowly picking up steam. Nice. Um, so that's the next big push is probably the pickup and delivery side of everything for us. Mm-hmm. Um, do you do drop off already? Mm-hmm. We, we okay. currently do it at uh, the other mega wash locations. Yeah. Okay. So those two stores are slightly or drastically different. I don't know. Maybe I'm putting words in your mouth. Um, business model, unattended versus attended. Yes. You mm-hmm. know, what I what we call sort of full service laundry centers, yes. mm-hmm. drop yeah. off, pick up and delivery, the whole nine yards. And this other one, not to call it the stepchild, because I'm sure it's very nice, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it's not it's not a full service laundry center. It's a stereotypical laundromat, but yeah. obviously a modernized laundromat. I want to go back for a minute. When you acquired yeah. each of these stores, and you can jump around if you want. I know there's a lot of people out there that are, you know, we always call them newbies in the industry. A lot of them are starting with a minimal budget, you know, not a lot of capital to invest. And those those zombie mats that we call them in the industry are are golden opportunities. You know, they're highly leverageable. You can borrow against, yep. you know, to put equipment in the store, things like that. Can you walk us through the process of each one of those? And, you know, you share whatever you want, whatever you're comfortable sharing, you know, financially, but the process of, you know, borrowing money to add new equipment to the store and allowing that to build over a couple of years. And then did you kind of rinse and repeat type of thing where you allow, well, that's what we've done. We call it stair-stepping, you know, did a project of 100, 150,000, and borrowed most of the money, took the money from the growth, reinvested, took mm-hmm. another step up the ladder, et cetera, et cetera. I think a lot of people are really intrigued by how people like you and us do that. And I'd love to hear your side of kind of the nuts and bolts. I know you're extremely hands-on, so I'm guessing you were in there doing a lot of the work yourself, maybe even installed your own equipment. What did that process look like for you? So the we'll start with the first store. Um, that one was... Um, we took some older equipment out of one of my dad's stores okay. that he he had kept, but we knew it was quality stuff. You know, uh-huh. mm-hmm. it was just end of life needed. You know, maybe a bearing job or something like that. So we did a bearing job on it, put it in, and then called it good. But it was uh, better than what was, was there, right? Exactly. You were you were yeah. making an improvement. It might not be you know earth shattering, but yeah, it was a yeah. step up. It wasn't a top loader. It mm-hmm. was you know it was you know a sixty pound machine or, or something like that. You know, some sure. capacity there. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, what we've done at that store is slowly stair-stepped a little bit at a time, new dryers, six new washers, four new washers and, and so forth, you know, to slowly build that store up, um, with it only being about 2000 square feet or so, it wasn't too, um, too scary, mm-hmm. so to speak, yep. to do a little bit at a time and, and kind of deal with what we had and, and, and so forth. Um, but what I found that in this unattended location has been the game changer for me is the uh, Hipsch command app mm-hmm. on my phone, allowing me to resolve any possible issues with a customer right then and there. Say, hey, this machine isn't working, whatever. All right, fine, move it to the next machine and I can start it with my phone. Mm-hmm. You know, so that, I mean, with an unattended store, I am the attendant all the time. My phone always rings. It's, it's me taking care of it. Right. So that's your downside there. Um, and then I realized rather quickly that this isn't where I wanted to go moving forward. 
So when we bought the building with Megawash, we ended up deciding that it needed to be attended. I wanted a, a different type mm -hmm. of laundry mat. I wanted to do different things. I wanted to do the wash, dry, fold. I wanted to do pickup delivery. So those things changed, changed our game plan moving forward to that's now our model to move forward. Mm -hmm. How so, long did it take you to figure out that the unattended um, self-serve model um, which is a still a higher end model because you've injected technology and new equipment yeah. and things like that. How how long did it take you to figure out that wasn't what you wanted to do in the future? And what was the thought behind that? Because we traveled a similar journey uh, mentally, but I'm, I'm curious yeah. what the timeline was like and and what drove that thought. Was it just revenue? Was it you got tired of the calls? <laughs> Some um, of both. <laughs> a, little, a little bit of both. Um, the 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 calls are constant you yeah. know no matter what um but the the better the equipment you have the, the less calls you have obviously mm -hmm. um i think that that plays a big part of it um confusion uh simplicity simplicity of the machines how user friendly they are i think that's mm -hmm. another issue um there, there's a lot of factors that play into it but i realized that having my day job and trying to work and then answering all these phone calls during the day when we're busy Mm -hmm. doesn't always work out so well, you know, yeah. it, it detracts from a lot. Um, it, it growth wise, revenue wise, it, it's a great store um, because there's no labor. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. yep. and some people are looking for that and that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I feel like you can have labor and have a better service if you can support the volume in order to mm -hmm. overcome your labor costs, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Well, and too, if you add drop off, then if they're exactly. processing the drop off, you know, that income helps offset yes. the labor yeah. costs as well. So, so, Matt, I know we're going to jump around here. I want to ask you a question because because I think this gets a I think the whole drop off fully attended, even pickup and delivery model. You know, I think it's shifting, but there was a time like, I'll say it like that. There was a time where in the industry, if you had an unattended store, a big part of the attraction of that was, you, you know, your labor, limited labor. Mm -hmm. Some of the negative was a hassle factor and things we've discussed. But then there was also a time in the industry and maybe this was around the time you got in the industry where a lot of people were saying, yeah, but if you go fully attended, you know, yeah, you can add drop off, but there's not much money there. Best you can hope for is to just to cover the labor, you know, and then you at least have an attended store. You don't get as many calls, but at the end of the day, you're not really making any more money. Yeah. That's not our experience. <laughs> What's your experience like from the economics, not the specifics, but just, is it, is it just been a wash break even, and at least I don't get the calls now, or uh, are these people that are sowing that narrative? And I'm not saying in some cases it isn't accurate, um, but I think that's shifting a lot in our industry nowadays. What's been your experience? I think it's shifting um, too. The uh, it's interesting because, like I said, I've been in this, but haven't been in this for 30 right. years. Mm -hmm. So, um, watching what my dad was doing at his stores that were attended, um, it was always never a, a thought to drive that further than to just take care of labor costs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, in, in his perception initially, uh, yep. now things have changed today, but yep. you know, back then that was the thought was that, Hey, if we could do some wash dry fold, we'll cover our labor costs. And then this store is as profitable as my unattended store. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in, in my experience, uh, you, if you're going to have a store that's attended, um, it's more profitable because you, you still have to account for that labor one way or the other um, if you're doing that model. So if you're having these people bring in revenue, you've, you've got uh, free labor, so to speak, mm -hmm. almost. And there's some profitability to that to a certain point. Um, and then I think once you scale it to enough where maybe you have two attendants, you still have to account for that labor and move forward that way. Um, yeah. But it's um, it, it has definitely changed over the time that I've been around the, in the industry to where it is now, where people are actually like, we can actually make money doing this mm -hmm. and it is profitable. The, um, the delivery side of it, I think is an interesting aspect that, that um, maybe isn't for everybody and that's mm -hmm. okay. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be. It's, uh, I think everything's going towards the Amazon idea of mm -hmm. at our fingertips on full our phone. service, full service. I don't yeah. want to deal with it, whatever, yeah. you know? So as, as the industry evolves, I think that there's going to be more and more desire for that, uh -huh. you know, yeah. to understand what it is. I think in my area, Kansas city, it's, it's just starting to take off. Mm -hmm. 
We've yeah, had that same before. issue. I mean, in Cincinnati, people don't, they didn't even know that pickup and delivery laundry was a thing. Yeah, like yeah. when we, when we started, everybody's like, oh, you're doing dry cleaning now? Mm-hmm. No, like regular laundry. Like, they're like, what? We don't understand. <laughs> like socks and underwear? Yeah. 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 We have customers come to the store. They're like, what are you doing back there? Well, we're processing clothes. And they're like, you do that? Yep. I don't have to do my clothes here. No, you don't have to. You, you can come pick it up and take care of it for you. Yep. Oh, that's interesting. You know, I mean, so yeah, e- even the people that walk in the door don't even understand that sometimes. Yeah. What has your pickup and delivery journey been like? Like, where did it start? How did you start? Um, what it's been like, it's, uh, it's As he it sort of is, uh, <laughs> I yeah. love it. I love it. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's interesting. The, um, I really haven't been focusing on the residential side. Um, we have ozone at our stores mm-hmm. and um, I, I kind of gotten a, a lucky little niche with some smoke remediation stuff mm-hmm. that uh, I think Dave and I had talked about. Yep. And so what we ended up doing is we're doing a lot of work for companies that go into smoke damaged houses and, mm-hmm. and pull out their clothes. And then we you know, restore them with our ozone system, pull that smoke smell out and mm-hmm. you know, sanitize them and turn them back around and, they're happy because they didn't have to buy all new clothes and it's an insurance thing. So Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. We need to we need to figure out how you manage that. We've tried. We've tried reaching out to like the smoke remediation and insurance companies and I've got nothing back. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting. Um it, it all started because of our website. Um one of the, the customer that I'm talking about specifically, uh, she reached out through our website and mm-hmm. saw that we had ozone and they knew what ozone was mm-hmm. because they use it themselves. They just didn't have the processing ability to handle as much as what they're getting. Yeah. And so it was basically an overflow issue on their end that caused them to look for other ways to get their stuff done. Were they just placing it in an ozone room? And and maybe our audience doesn't know what that is. If that's the case, right. do you, can you explain that real quick? Yeah. So so they had, in their case, what they used is they have ozone rooms or lockers. Mm-hmm. And then they, they bundle everything in there and then they, you know, pound it full of ozone. And then that helps draw everything out. Um, they have a washer, one washer, <laughs> <laughs> and, and one dryer. But uh, they said that the process on this chamber washer was about two and a half hours to wash one cycle. Wow. Wow. So us being able to take, you know, a thousand pounds of clothes yep. and process it in a week and come back all folded, ready to go, hung up, however they yep. wanted it to be done. I already had the labor, I already got the people, I already got the facility, the machines, the ozone system in the water, and boom, it was done. So they were very happy. And so we've continued that relationship for quite a while now. That is awesome. Have you had any, and we talked about that on some of our coaching calls. For some of you that don't know, Matt's a coaching client of ours. Uh, him and his, his dad did attend our pickup and delivery workshop recently. Mm-hmm. So he's he's full you know full speed ahead into this thing. But I'm curious, Matt, what uh, have you had any other luck at obtaining other accounts? Because that's really what Carla was getting at mm-hmm. since our coaching call. And I told you on that call, I was like, oh, I'm taking this and running with it. <laughs> uh, we've, we've updated our website, put mm-hmm. you know strategic keywords, things like that. We have sent out some emails and stuff like that. So far, haven't hit on anything. But as you and I talked about on that coaching call, just hitting on one franchise, for example, can really be a game changer mm-hmm. for you. Have you yeah. had any luck obtaining accounts outside of that one where they reached out to you? Any uh, sure. advice to the audience for that? So I've, I've just recently started to feel comfortable enough that we can maybe handle some more. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because they've been giving us so much, it's been almost maxing my labor out. Mm. Nice uh, problem to have. Right? So um, trying to put some of your implementation on scaling in and mm-hmm. work that route in order to be able to handle more has been my process since the pickup and delivery workshop. Mm-hmm. Okay. And from that, I have just now started to feel comfortable that I've got enough people and enough hours, time to actually maybe handle a second one. So I just started reaching out about two weeks ago to a couple of them. Um, I haven't had any luck yet, but the one that I'm dealing with, it it just seems like as soon as I think that they're not going to have something for me, they've got a ton of stuff. Yeah. (laughs) So it's kind of a hard balance and Mm -hmm. figure that out, but, but we're slowly getting there. Um, I do think that, um, from that customer, she has recommended us to other people mm-hmm. and given us some residential stuff and things like that instead. So, you know, it's kind of an organic growth yeah. mm-hmm. from, from it right now. 
Yeah, I've talked to a few people on the Facebook groups and stuff that have had moderate success reaching out to fire departments and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's yeah. something we're kind of poking around at too, for sure. Um, but yeah, very smart, very smart mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, excited for you for sure. So let me ask you a question. When you talk about your unattended store and you talk about the fact that it has no labor. Yeah. Walk me through what that looks like. How, how does the store get cleaned? Is it, are these contractors? Do you just mean no W-2 yeah. labor or yeah. are you cleaning yeah, no, yourself? No, yeah, no uh, no individual employed directly by me or, or my company. Okay. Um, I do have somebody that comes in and cleans. It's a, it's a contract and okay. she just takes care of it, you know, multiple times and then it closes up at the end of the night. So gotcha. Awesome. that's how that one works. Um, so when I say no labor, there is labor, obviously. Sure. Uh, the rest of the time, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> taking right. care of it. You fill in the gaps. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. Have you ever thought about offering drop off at that location or is the demographics not good? Is, I don't think the demographics 2, are Because 2,000 square there. foot isn't, isn't that small. With, with the square footage, it's pretty maxed out. It would be really tough to have okay. an office and all the other things and stuff like that or any kind of storage for them. Um, yeah. But with the pickup and delivery, you know, it's, it's interesting because then we could just offer it out of one centralized location in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know that my labor is going to be there, have staff there, go pick mm -hmm. stuff up, bring it back to them and let them take care of it there. So yep. um, at the 6,000 square foot store, we've got plenty of, uh, plenty of square footage for mm -hmm. that stuff. So. Yeah. And for those of you listening, that that business model is often referred to as a hub and spoke type of model yeah. where you basically act as a drop store. And mm -hmm. and I, I don't know the history for sure, but I think the dry cleaning industry kind of captured that, you know, probably before we were born um, of having what they call drop stores. And obviously mm -hmm. our retail laundromats can act as drop stores and it can justify the cost of labor, even though you don't need much storage. That's mm -hmm. kind of what Matt's referring to there. Um, so you don't always have to have enough equipment or enough backroom storage space. You can you can hub and spoke the model together. And essentially what happens is you have five or six or seven different drop stores and you have your trucks, your fleet of drivers that go out. And yes, they pick up laundry from customers, homes and businesses. And then while they're out as a part of the route, they're picking up two or three, 400 pounds from this location and this location and this location. They bring them back to the production facility, uh, process the laundry where you have a lot more room, turn it back around, and it ends up, ends up just sitting on the shelf. Essentially, what you're doing is you're acting as your own wholesale supplier, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. So just another another tip to share with everybody out there. That's something that can be really effective. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we love to tell people, hey, when you think you can't do something, really what you're saying is you just haven't figured out the, the art of it yet. But there's a lot of times a way to do it. Where there's a will, there's a way, as they say, right? Mm -hmm. So Matt, I know you're a big proponent of adding more technology mm -hmm. into your laundromats and just for people to add them more into the laundromat industry. What technology do you see as some of the greatest assets in stores, in your stores, and why? Greatest asset in regard for me or for the user? Both. Both. Very let's, 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 <laughs> let's define. But what are, what's that's the critical point, technology we need to add? That's a great so, point. I appreciate you bringing that up mm -hmm. because I think a lot of times we talk about it from one side of the aisle or the mm -hmm. other, and it, mm -hmm. it misleads people unintentionally. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it all depends on um, what what you need for you mm -hmm. as to what would be your greatest asset. But then there's the other side for the customer, mm -hmm. which don't really necessarily coincide. So you've got something for the customer is, in my opinion, is ease of payment. There, there is an amazing amount of people who will gladly download an app, scan a machine and start it. Mm -hmm. um, on my end, me being able to pick up my phone and see a report of how things are going today, how, what revenue is bringing in for my machines, you know, or how many upcharges they're getting from extra mod cycle modifiers to all of that uh, is great analytics that allows me to make decis decisions that I probably wouldn't be able to make if I was sitting there trying to count quarters. Mm -hmm. You know, I can go in today and say, hey, you know, my 135 pound machine ran 90 times last month. Okay. So it cost me this every time it turns, I made this amount of money, you know, is, is, is this actually worthwhile or not? Maybe I've got a price too high. Maybe I've got a price too low. I need, I need to look at those things and figure out my costs and everything like that. Mm -hmm. And then, it, you know, just machine utilization too. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think that those are important tools for as a business owner, but for the customer, it has to be something that makes their life easier. The easier we make their life, the easier we make it for them to spend money and the easier it is for them to do those upcharges, the more revenue we make. So then that those are not necessarily coinciding things, but they are very different things that, that all add to a package that you need to figure out for yourself. Like uh, Electrolux has an app on, on their machines mm-hmm. called Laundry Pay. And I've gotten at my new store an app adoption rate of about 60%, which I didn't think I get 60% of the people walking in the door is downloading an app and mm-hmm. scan a machine to start. And that's in a fairly short period of time, right? Because you just opened yeah. We, we've only been open for about uh, two and a half months. Wow. Wow. So um, it's it's pretty wild. The cool thing is, is that, you know, we explain to them how easy it is to use. Mm-hmm. And as soon as they explain to them how easy it is to use and the benefits that benefits them, they're like, oh, well, I'm not going to bring quarters to the laundry mat anymore. I'm just going to mm-hmm. put my money on here. Well, then that, that also in turn gives, gives them loyalty for me mm-hmm. and they want to see it. They can be at their house and they can look on there and go, oh, there's 24 washers available. I guess I could go now. Mm-hmm. Oh, cool. You know, stuff like that. Um, Are you so, hybrid, though? Do you take coins as well or is uh, it all? Every okay. location takes coins. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't want to alienate people at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I feel like that um, there are some systems that are probably more owner friendly than user friendly. Mm-hmm. And that it has to be something that you decide whether or not you want to alienate those customers. Yeah. Do you do quarters or dollars? Um, I'm getting ready to convert my unattended store to dollars. Yeah. Uh, I was at quarters there. Dave and I talked a lot about that. And we're moving. It's so them. nice to not have to collect as often. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then I think it also makes it easier on the customer to spend their money mm-hmm. a little bit. So, so let me ask you a question. You've talked about how technology and some of the other things, what was your, uh, when you were evolving and growing these stores from, from zombie mats to yeah. moder- what I call modernized laundromats, what were the economics? Like when you invested, you know, we, you're on the Facebook groups, you see this all the time, right? People are, yeah. oh, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I could spend $150,000 on new equipment. So I'm going to spend 50 on used equipment. Whenever you've bought new equipment, has that has that been a good investment for you? What's the what's the thought process? And we're all unique and different. We're just trying yeah. to learn from you. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll probably never buy anything used unless I know where it came from. Like maybe possibly out of one of my dad's stores or something mm-hmm. like that. You know, um, one the the stuff only has a certain amount of life expectancy. Mm-hmm. Um, at a certain point, that you know the, the equipment's wore out and everything like that. And let's say you spend. 50 cents on a dollar to buy some used equipment. Or you could go out and finance some new stuff with Alliance or Electrolux or whoever you use, doesn't mm-hmm. matter. Um, then you get tax write-offs on top of that, that mm-hmm. a lot of people seem to forget. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and that is, is huge. Plus you get you know efficiency, you get... Uh, possible uh well the latest and greatest technology for one you know so you can see that these machines are slowly evolving i come from the hvac world and everything is connected everything talks to each other Mm -hmm. everything is extremely efficient laundromat equipment is just now starting to see (laughs) some of that efficiency and some of that connectivity together finally in the last Mm -hmm. maybe 10 years or so and it's still pretty far behind a lot of other industries, in my opinion. Agreed. Um, so I would want to be on the latest and greatest version of whatever machine that you're looking at, you know, for the connectivity, uh, end of life cycle issues. Um, I know that um, <laughs> that like some equipment in I purchased in 2017, Alliance then said the next year, well, we're no longer going to make that board for that one. So that's great. <laughs> you know, so I bought a machine because I didn't buy the latest and greatest. I bought the previous version. Mm-hmm. That was the end of that life cycle for that board. Mm-hmm. So now if that board goes bad, what's it going to cost me? Mm-hmm. You know, and then warranties and all the other things and stuff like that. Um, I've never regretted buying any new equipment in any way, shape or form. 
um, customers like it. You're able to charge more. You're able to um, get those connectivity issues and stuff like that, like things I was talking about with the you know the Hitch Command app, where you can actually remote start a machine or mm-hmm. even just change pricing on the fly or something like that. So I think there's a lot of advantages to having new equipment. Probably the biggest one is the connectivity, the ease of use, and um, you know just efficiency. As a mechanical, you you fix a lot of your own equipment. Is that correct? Yeah. I, okay. Yeah. As as someone that's pulling off the the boards and the front panels and maybe even doing bearing jobs, I know you mentioned you did at one point. Um, those types of things. Does does being boots on the ground and mechanical make you look at your equipment differently? Yeah, like, I would say so. Things. Uh, do you see things in new equipment? that other owners wouldn't see when they make comments like uh, all they care about is it washes or clothes and different things like that. Well, um, so it, it's interesting. Um, I've got, I've gone towards soft mounts at my new store mm-hmm. yep. and uh, the ozone system and stuff like that. The mm-hmm. soft mount commercial stuff is, is a lot different than what a lot of people initially told me when I first got into this. Mm-hmm. Um, what were you told? I'm curious. <laughs> it was all a problem. It was, you know, oh, it's just never going to last. It's not going to work very well, blah, 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 this other stuff, you know. And it, it has been um, a game-changing differentiator between my stores and my competitors. Mm-hmm. Um, customers say on, I mean, repetitively, that their clothes come out cleaner at my stores than anywhere else. Part of that is the high 450 G extract. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of that, you know, because you're extracting so much higher, you're pulling all that moisture and dirt out that you wouldn't at a 200 G machine. You spend less time in the dryer. Mm -hmm. So then, then we're able to turn over more customers quicker. And they're only able to, they only needed about 20, 25 minutes to dry, maybe even less sometimes. And the time savings for them is huge. And they're appreciative of it. They're willing to pay more to have that time back. Instead of spending two hours at the laundry room at their in and out in 45, they're happy. So I was not aware. I know 400G is kind of like the new thing with, with washers and everything. But why is it only available on soft mount and not hard mount? So the the basket has, mm-hmm. you know, uh, shocks and springs and, and mm-hmm. full suspension system in there, uh, allowing it to move. Yeah. Around. Absorb as, all that spin. Yeah, as it spins and, and it ramps up, yeah. So, you know, one of the things I uh, I want to point out here, Matt, and you can elaborate as you wish, is I think one of the reasons that soft mount machines in general as a category get a bad rap is because we're having two different conversations. Um, there's another category that, that most of us are now kind of referring to as home style machines. Yeah. They are the, sure. the horizons and the Maytag Neptunes and the, yeah. and, and those are technically soft mount machines, but they are not what I call commercial grade soft yeah. mount machines. Yeah. So how do you tell if it's a commercial grade soft mount because the horizons they're made by it they're sold as commercial how do you tell if it's commercial grade soft mount versus a home so type soft mount the the biggest difference i think would probably be the door gasket system okay um, the door is on a what i think dave and i are referring to as a commercial uh, soft mount mm-hmm. the door is actually mounted to the tub side of everything Okay. versus like the horizon where the door is actually mounted and there's a gasket in between mm-hmm. for the actual tub. Mm-hmm. So there's this okay. gasket that actually holds here. The door is actually mounted to the frame of the machine. Okay. The difference between where the door put door is actually placed. And I think mm-hmm. that's, that's what we're talking about. It basically makes the biggest difference. And then the, the small home style ones are kind of limited to capacity of maybe like 20 pounds mm-hmm. or so. Um, I'm, I'm talking all the way up to like 135 pound machines, you know, so massive machines to 20 pound machines too, but, but there is a difference. Are soft mount cheaper too? No. They no. Are, are they more expensive? expensive. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, so ultimately for all of you listening out there, this is just Dave, Dave pontificating for a minute here, but when it comes to equipment, we have the top loaders, pretty self-explanatory, right? Mm-hmm. Then we have the home style machines, which are technically soft mount machines. So you may say you hate soft mount machines because you had a bad experience with what we're calling a home style machine. 
Mm-hmm. Those are two different things. Those are the reason I call them home style is I think they're closer to a residential grade machine. No offense to the manufacturers um, yeah. than a commercial than a truly commercial grade machine. Mm-hmm. Those are the, those are two categories of what we call small chassis, smaller capacity mm-hmm. washers that may be used in a commercial setting, meaning a retail setting in a laundromat. They can be vended, card, coin, whatever. But that doesn't change the infrastructure, right? Mm. And then we get into what I call truly commercial, which is commercial grade soft mount machines, which is what Matt's talking about. These are the Electrolux, the Continental Gerbao, you know, Alliance makes those machines. Most of the manufacturers do. And then there's the hard mount machines, rigid mount machines is what we call them, that don't have the shock absorbers and the things that Matt was talking about. So once again, not here to tell you what to buy, what not to buy. Just understand when you're having a conversation and maybe you're a newbie in the industry and you're going, oh, well, I heard commercial or I heard uh, soft mount machines are crap and you should never buy them. It's like, well, there are people that feel real strongly about Mm -hmm. that, but they're actually talking about home style machines Mm -hmm. and they're not talking about truly what I call truly commercial grade machines. And I know the manufacturers and engineers get all worked up that it's all commercial equipment and I just respectively disagree. (laughs) So anyway, hopefully that conversation helps people out a little bit. Matt actually has experience with both Mm -hmm. um, and he's very mechanical and he gets in there and works on his equipment and stuff. Mm -hmm. So thought it was a great conversation to have. So let me ask you this, as we wrap up today, you've evolved through the industry in a very unique way. So you started at five, you know, poking around with dad and being dad's helper (laughs) and handing him screwdrivers. And then you grew through your formative teenage years and you still were poking around and handing him screwdrivers and he probably helped let you help a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And then you quote unquote left the industry, but you know, you were still, I'm sure in the industry, because I know you're very close with your family. You were still around it. Then you jumped into the industry in zombie mat settings. And then now you operate what I would refer to, and this is just my opinion, modernized laundromats that are, I would consider you to be a top of the industry operator. Not that any of us have ever arrived, but I would consider (laughs) you that category of an operator in your facilities to be where you are. What sets you apart? Like, what are the benefits? Because I hear so many people say, and I, I, you know, I used to believe some of this stuff, to be honest with you, you know, you, 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 this is overbuilt, you spent too much money, and you, you'll never get your money back out of X. You know, I see those, th- I don't think it's a secret what my opinions are. What are your opinions? So anything that I can do to be different than the guy down the street and add value to the customer, I think is, is what sets any of us apart. Mm-hmm. Um, there is plenty of zombie mats around me already still, even from the locations that I've rehabbed. And what sets my, me apart from those locations is trying to have, you know, the amenities that the customers want something different than, than the guy down the street. It, at the end of the day, we're, we're providing a trash can that spins water and throws out some clothes, you know, right? I mean, sounds fancy. Not, yeah, right? There, there's nothing to now it, the know? manufacturers are really upset. With yeah, they're time. really happy. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's a so, trash can. <laughs> so anyways, why is my trash can better than the guy's trash can down the street? You know, what is it that I have that he doesn't have? Or what is it that I can have that he doesn't have? So trying to differentiate myself in, in an experience and a value for each and every customer has to be something that I, I'm looking for constantly to try to make their experience better, to give them better value back. And that's why they choose me and choose to come to my store versus the guy down the street. Mm-hmm. Can so, you have in your experience? Can you charge more for that? Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah, um, I would say on average, I'm probably thirty to forty percent higher vent price on every single machine than my competitors. Good in, for you in, in every area. Just real quick, can you kind of list off what you would consider your key differentiators between you and your competition? Um, okay. The key differentiators um, between myself and the competition is the ozone systems. Um, Having the ability to say that our washers are sanitized, your clothes are sanitized, and that it removes those smells. I think that's huge. Um, The next differentiator is touchscreen machines, um, user-friendly. I think that that really plays a big part. And then uh, 450G machines, soft mount machines, make another big difference. 
that the extraction process, you know, once again, gets clothes cleaner and then it makes them spend less time in the store, which is, you know, allows me more turns per day. Well, and allows them more of their day. <laughs> more of their day. That's right. Yeah. 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 People, people have this, uh, you know, infamous quote of there's nothing people like better than free. And I always say that's, that's actually not true. They like fast better than free. Uh, well, cause that's if, free yeah. time. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yep. So it, the, 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 the old adage of nobody, you know, everybody likes everything better than free assumes that they have unlimited time, but limited money. And yeah. in our society today, that's mm -hmm. flipped in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. Certainly not everybody. People yeah. value their time more than their money in many, many cases, especially yeah. when you can bring tremendous value. All right. So, so I'm going to throw out, Go I'm going to throw out something that Good. I know about Matt just because um, of our conference and everything. And we got to talk. So it is Matt, very, no, just so is, you guys know, Matt and his dad came to our pickup and delivery <laughs> workshop in Cincinnati. It was a blast. We had so much fun. Mm -hmm. He's been a coaching client of ours for a while now, but the truth is Matt and Carla got to be buddies at the workshop. Oh, <laughs> he got stuck by me at dinner and I talk a lot. And <laughs> But if, as if he is not amazing enough with a full-time HVAC job and owning now four laundromats and you're a dad. During COVID, you picked up another business and also have trained for uh, bodybuilding competitions. Can you share a little bit about <laughs> yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Um, so let's see. Um, uh, right before the world shut down for COVID, uh, my wife and I were opening up a Hotworks fitness studio. And what that is, is it's a 24 hour infrared fitness studio where you do a workout inside a sauna at 125 degrees <gasps> with a virtual. That sounds horrible. Instructor. Sorry. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome, but not for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it, it's, uh, it, it's not like the typical sauna. Typical sauna is 180 degrees. It's not infrared. So this is a lot lower heat. Um, yeah. But uh, it does feel really good. It feels like the sun. Um, oh, nice. But uh, it's uh, it's a good way to sweat and, and get some infrared, you know, benefits. Yeah. Uh, my wife Cleanse. handles those. We have two of those <laughs> four, two of those fitness studios here in Kansas City. Um, she she pretty much runs those, and I take care of the laundry mat side. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, as far as a bodybuilding show, yeah, I did that um, about a year ago, uh, November. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it was uh, it was fun. It was something I plan to do after I turn 40 and, uh, you know, wanted to try it out and, and spend, you know, a good amount of time dedicated to working out and eating right and, and stepped on stage. It was, it was a lot of fun. That is awesome. Very cool. You have to be so disciplined. Oh, <laughs> all right. Well, listen, we want to end this episode today, but I have a couple more quick questions for you if you sure. have a couple minutes. So Carla talked about the COVID things and the hot works and all this. I wanted to hit this angle because I think it's really powerful. You told us that at one point, before, let's call it pre-COVID, you and your wife were kind of tired of laundromats. And that's what led you into the fitness studios. Yeah. And then the country shut down. Yeah. Yeah. They wouldn't give you your licenses for the fitness studios. Now you have them open, so now you have them both. And yeah. what you learned is when laundromats were deemed essential, and then you started to learn more about the modernization of the industry and technology and how to separate yourself. And I'm putting a few words in your mouth here. It shifted your mentality about your laundromat business. And from my perspective, it seems like, and I haven't known you that long, but it seems like it kind of flipped the script and caused you to behave differently, make different decisions, and you've gotten different results. Is that a yeah. fair fair assessment? And walk that, us through that because I think that's yeah. powerful stuff. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, I think everybody was scared at that point in time. You know, oh, yeah. um, when yeah. everything shut down, we were like, "What is going to happen?" You know, I mean, um, I know that basically my wife and I were sitting at home going, "What are we going to do? How 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 is this going to work?" And if we hadn't had the laundromats to help support us that were uh, you know, deemed essential that stayed open, we probably wouldn't be able to have made it through that first fitness studio that we opened because uh, we had to make the payment somehow. And yeah. it wasn't coming in because they wouldn't let us open. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, it made us look at those uh, businesses in a different light. And in turn, during that time, um, I made the decision to move forward and trying to, like you say, modernize them, try to try to come up with other ways and things that, that we could do in order to make them more profitable and easier for us mm -hmm. to live with day in, day out. Um, they are a lot of work. I think everybody knows that. This isn't for some completely hands-off type of person. I mean, yep. this, this 
lifestyle doesn't work that way. Yep. Um, but it did allow us to look at things differently. And then that kind of forced us to really evaluate the ozone because I was looking at that prior mm. to COVID. Um, but as soon as the COVID happened, I'm like, I should have had this a long time ago. And moving forward, everybody else has changed their mentality on sanitization and on cleanliness and, and so forth. I think that um, that then, you know, funneled us into other ways to, to come up with other options for people to not handle money, which was the app pay, mm -hmm. which was, you know, less, less overall um, points of contact. Yeah. Yeah. yeah points yeah. of contact. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Less, less interchange. Mm -hmm. So any of those kinds of things that we could do that, to help our customers and make them feel safer, make them feel more um, clean. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, the laundromat is supposed to feel clean. You're supposed to feel clean after you leave the laundromat, not, mm -hmm. not dingy and dirty. Like some <laughs> other places, you know, um, so you know, anything we can do to do that. Um, and we just kind of focused on it and reevaluated what we wanted to do and, and the value it was to us as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. <clears throat> well, thank you for sharing that with us. I thought that was worth adding in here because I know that, you know, anyone that's in any industry long enough, there's going to become times when maybe we're not disenfranchised or maybe we are, but we're at least just down, you know, to words like burnout, bored, mm -hmm. I've done everything there is to do, those types of things. Um, you know, I, I feel like there's, I don't know how many people watch the show, but there's people out there in our industry that have golden opportunities right below their feet that they actually own. And if they were to just make pivots, I'm not saying drastic changes, but small pivots and continue to do what they've done for maybe 20 or 30 years, but just pivot 10, 15, 20 percent one or two times over the course of the next three or five years, yeah. I think they might find that they fall completely in love with a completely different industry. Because I'm not sure that I ever reach burnout. I've always loved the industry. But as I evolved from the different phases of the industry to where we are now, I've definitely found a different level of passion mm -hmm. that was even more so than I knew before. So as you find a different business model and a different value prop and a different industry and, yes, different revenue streams and different margins, right. you all of a sudden start to fall back in love or more in love with a business that maybe you once loved or you once liked. So yeah. I like that's part of the reason we do this show and do our workshops and things like that is to just to show people a different version of the same industry. Well, listen, man, thank you so much for sharing the story and your journey with us. I know I know our audience is going to get a lot out of this. One last question for me, maybe two last questions for go today. <laughs> no, maybe three. No. <laughs> so so one of them is. If you could go back to 2016, and I know you have a little bit of an advantage because of your dad and everything. If you can go back to 2016 and do things differently in 2016, what would you do differently? And I know I'm putting you on the spot yeah. there. No, no, no. That's, that's a good question. Um, with the first store, I think I would have invested more on aesthetics than I did initially. Okay. Um, I, I could have made the place look a lot nicer. Um, with a few things, you know, like the epoxy floors and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Stuff that, that doesn't really necessarily need to be redone every so often, but, mm -hmm. but, but adds value and, and adds some um, aesthetics to the, to the building and stuff like that, or the, the space, so to speak, mm -hmm. for the customers. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen your new store. You're doing that now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that new yeah. store is nice. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's a few things like that. You know, there, there's, there's always something that you look back and go, ah, Hindsight's 2020 and I should have done this, you know, um, probably the other side of that too would be invest a little bit more in the equipment right off the bat, um, instead of maybe doing it quite as phased as I did. Mm. Um, I hear a lot very, of people say that that's, that's very interesting to me because we actually fall into that category. I mean, yeah. you just don't, you don't know, right? I mean, it's terrifying to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and, you know, I have coaching clients even who trust me with credibility and things like that. And they're like, Dave, tell me I've got to get this money back. This is crazy. <laughs> How am I going to get this back $1 at a time? This is nuts. Right. All right. Well, listen, Matt, thanks for taking the time to share your story with us today. Yeah, thank you. My only one last one thing for you is, hey, if people want to reach out to you, how can they do so? Um, I'm on pretty much all of the uh, Facebook forums. Uh, okay. Matt Hilton or Matthew Hilton on there. Um, that'd probably be the best way. Just DM me on there, something like that. Okay. Okay. 
Awesome. awesome. All right. Well, listen, man, thanks for joining us today. Obviously, we already know you pretty well, but it's been fun getting to know you a little bit better and spending mm-hmm. a little time with you. For everyone back home, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Laundromat Millionaire Show. We'll see you in a few weeks for another one. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you.